Um, I have a few announcements before we go into worship. I got a text from Darius this morning. He says, I'm feeling much better, but I'm still dealing with a cough and lingering congestion. I finished my five days of ivermectin Friday. It was very effective, but my doctor said that I will be fatigued for a week or two. I'll be back in church next week. So that was good news. Um, the other one, I'm going to do something I've never done in this church before and hope I never do again. <laughs> but we're going to take a little tiny vote this morning. If you remember last year, we um, had a collect, we, we had a, 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 a Sunday undie day and we collected underwear and socks for the children at Richfield and they were very appreciative of it. And I got a, uh, an email from um, their, the, um, no, the counselor, the counselor at, at the school. And he, he, he said, you know, I, I'm, he feels really bad about doing what he's doing, but I appreciate it. He says, we gave out all that we could from Undy Sunday collections, and we still have some as backups here for when the children have accidents, which brings me to my idea if y'all want to help us again this year. On some occasions, we have children who have accidents, bathroom accidents at school, and we're not able to contact a parent to bring some clean clothes. I have a lot of t-shirts, but I, ha I do not have any inexpensive bottoms. I'm thinking if your church would like to help us again this year, gym shorts or leggings in youth, small to extra large, in gender neutral colors, black, gray, and navy, shorts would work well for both boys and girls and leggings for the girls. So I'm just going to just take a quick vote here if we would like to do this, and if so, I'll go ahead and get that ball rolling. So who would like to take on this outreach for this church this year? Raise your hand. That's a majority. We're going to do it. Okay. I will let him know that we're, we're going to do that. Um, Jan, do you have a report on Lamar? He's doing good. Yeah. Yeah. Just really tired from. So we're hoping to get Darius back before Founders Day. I mean, Lamar back before Founders Day. <laughs> but, but we know if you've been through it, chemo, radiation just breaks you down. And um, so anyway, we will keep, we keep Lamar. And um, I haven't heard from Debbie Cole. But I know she was having a really hard time at, at first with the surgery. So keep, keep Debbie in prayer. Um, don't forget we've got um, a real important short, brief meeting downstairs 10 to 15 minutes after church. If, if you can try to stay just for a minute. Um, are there any other prayer requests other than what's in the bulletin and what I've lifted up? Praise reports. Report on Zeb. Uh, he has a And your niece, Angela. No, no good news. So keep keep Angela. Well, we've all been lifting her, but but um, the family's having a really hard time right now. All right. Are there any other announcements from the community? 
I do have another prayer request. Um, I've talked with, I think, everyone about this, but um, I have had, I have been in conversation with John Earnhardt for maybe four months now, and um, Tanya Skeely, who does revivals. I promised John Yelton before the pandemic we would have a revival at this church, and I want to make good on that. I want y'all to please be praying about a revival for our church. Um, we've got, I've got two good people that are wanting to help. Ken's got some ideas that we'll share later. Um, but, but for anything to work and work well, we need to be in diligent prayer about it. So if you, if you keep a prayer journal, when you pray for our church, pray for the revival that God wants to happen in this community through our church. Um, because I have had this burden for years and then the pandemic came and so um, I just, uh, I, I'm just asking you to join me in prayer about revival in this community, either at the park or here at the church or over at Vivian's store, just, you know, wherever God leads us to, to te teach the word of Jesus, that's where we want to go. I think that's all the announcements that I have. Uh, our community town crier just walked in. Have you got any uh, announcements from the community? Um, nothing in particular. Nothing new. Yeah, I didn't know about that. You and I have got to communicate better. But, but I, I would not have been able to come. We, David and I were in meetings all day, so, so I wouldn't have been able to come. But I, I saw your post on Facebook. I said, mm, I would have liked to have been there. <laughs> so if there are no other announcements or prayer requests, good morning. Welcome to Gold Hill. If you have joined us online, I am Pastor Beverly Malden. Uh, we are in Gold Hill, North Carolina, and if this is your first time joining us, please leave a message. Tell us where you are from and how we best can pray for you. If you have been engaging with us uh, for some time and, and you're enjoying what you're seeing and hearing, and you want to help with our mission uh, outreaches such as shorts for children at Richfield, uh, you can send a gift to uh, Gold Hill United Methodist Church, uh, Post Office Box 52, Highway 52, Gold Hill, North Carolina, 28071. So someday I'm going to feel comfortable about that. And we do appreciate, we do get gifts sometimes, and, and it does help with our um, missions and food banks, and, and so we do appreciate that. Uh, if there are no other announcements, if you would stand and join me in the call to worship on page 335. And let's welcome the Holy Spirit, the Son of God, and our loving Father into church with us. <clears throat>
excerpts from Matthew in uh, chapter 16. And Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They said to one another, is it because we brought no bread? And becoming aware of what they were talking about, Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the five thousands and how we had so many baskets left over? Or the seven loaves for the four thousands and how many baskets you gathered? How could you fail to perceive that I was not talking about bread? Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he had not told them to beware of the yeast of bread, but to beware of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so then Jesus came and he asked the disciples, who do the people here at Caesarea say that the Son of Man is? And they said to him, some say John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven." And then he sternly ordered the disciples to not tell anyone he was the Messiah just yet. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you would now open your hymn books to page 881 and let us join in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of Let us go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Loving Father, we come to you this morning, all from different places with different experiences, but we're all on the same journey, the journey of life, the journey of drawing closer to you, the journey of becoming more perfect like Christ. And we stumble on that journey. We forget to praise your name first thing in the morning. So right now, I claim to you, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, everyone in here, Lord, wants to praise your precious holy name. We stumble through the day and we forget 
who this Jesus that we serve and love is. And sometimes, Lord, we try to make you be the Jesus that we think we want and need. Forgive us so much for doing that. Your Son came to teach us, to preach your word, and to fulfill your promises. And that is all, so that we could be saved and live with you forever that we will never taste the, the taste of death. So we thank you, God, for Jesus, and forgive us when we try to mold him into our image that we feel we need. Father, we have many prayer requests. The prayer team lifted up so many to you on Wednesday. We've got prayer requests this morning. We're missing um, friends that are not well, we ask you to please be with Lamar and with Darius, and we ask that you be with Debbie and help her heal. We have many friends that have gone and are going through cancer and treatment for cancer, and some are doing well and some are not doing so well. And Father, we ask that you put your hand of healing on each of these friends and loved ones we have that are suffering from this terrible, terrible disease. COVID is keeping our brothers and sisters at home and out of churches all over the country this morning. We ask that you eradicate this virus so that people can be your disciples so that we can come to church on Sunday morning and get refueled and, and, and have the energy and the courage and the Word of God to lean on when we meet others that need prayer or that need our help or that just need to see a smile and the love of God from someone. So God, we've got to get everyone well so they can get back to church, so they can have that one hour to refuel for the next week. And Lord, most of all, I ask that you forgive me and all of us for our many sins, for the many times we have not loved you as we should, and we have not loved our brothers and sisters as you taught us to. I ask you forgive us for those moments when we were not walking with you and we were not bringing honor to your holy name. And Lord, we, we at this moment take a moment to pray those prayers that in this holy sanctuary that, that we can only lift to you, that we do not share with others, but it is comforting to lift them to you in this place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, I do pray for the revival that you have planted in my heart, that, that it is going to, that I will listen to you, that, that I will seek your wisdom and, and whatever committee and team takes this, that, that we will honor you with this. And we just seek you and your wisdom and your Holy Spirit and the guidance of your spirit and the love of Jesus as we start talking and planning about this revival that we need for this community. And God, I just thank you so much that our doors are open every Sunday and that our friends keep coming back. Lord, we just love you so much and we thank you for teaching us how to love and care for others. And now, as you taught your disciples to pray, we join that prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. <coughs>
men. <clears throat> now if the usher would come forward for our tithes and offerings, <clears throat> and as you give your gifts to God, give a gift of words of peace to one another. with me and for me. Loving Father, I ask that 
the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be pure and holy it through your eyes and to your heart. Amen. So who is this real Jesus? There are, you, you didn't know there were so many different Jesuses in this world, did you? The greatness of God is clearly displayed by His Son, our Savior, that we know and love and walk with every day. And the glory of the gospel is made evident only in the Son of God. The promises and covenants from the Old Testament, all the prophets, they came to fruition only through this Son of our God. And that's why the question that Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew is so important. Do you, did you not find it strange the first time you read that scripture in your life that Jesus was asking his disciples, who am I? I, 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 I think the first time you hear that, you think they've been with him for three years. Who does he think they are? But this question, I think, is, is more crucial and, and even more real um, in our day because no one, no one is more popular in our nation or even in the world maybe, but especially in our nation, than Jesus Christ. Everybody knows Jesus Christ, but not everybody knows the real Jesus. You see, there's the Republican Jesus who's against tax collections and increases and activist judges and stands for uh, family values and owning firearms. And there's a Democrat Jesus who is against Wall Street and is against Walmart because they've got this big carbon footprint going on and, and they, they want to reduce that. And then there's therapist Jesus. This Jesus helps us to cope with life's problems and heals our past and tells us just how valuable and worthy we are and just don't be so hard on yourself. And then there's Starbucks Jesus. He drinks fair trade coffee. He loves spiritual conversations. He drives a hybrid and goes to all the film festivals. There's the open-minded Jesus. Jesus who loves everyone all the time, no matter what, except if you're not as open-minded as he is. And then there's the touchdown Jesus. We all know this Jesus. He helps athletes uh, to run faster and jump higher than non-Christians and determines the outcome of the Super Bowl every year. There's the martyr Jesus. This Jesus was a good man. And he died a cruel death, and we all feel sorry for him. And we believe in his goodness and his teachings. There's the gentle Jesus. This Jesus is meek and mild and has the high cheekbones and hair as long as mine and the color as mine. He wears a sash while looking very German. Then there's the hippie Jesus. This Jesus teaches everyone to please give peace a chance. And, and imagine a world with no religion and helps us to remember that all you need is love. We remember those lines, don't we? There's the yuppie Jesus who encourages us to fulfill our potential to reach for the stars and go by a boat. There's the spirituality Jesus who hates religion, churches, pastors, priests, doctrine, and would rather have people out in nature, over across the street in the park, walking around to find the God within while listening to ambiguously spiritual music. And there's the platitude Jesus. Good for Christmas specials, greeting cards, and bad sermons. Inspiring people to believe in themselves. There's a revolutionary Jesus who teaches us to rebel against the status quo, stick it to the man, and blame everything on the system. And there's the guru Jesus, a wise and inspirational teacher who believes in you and helps you to find your center. 
There's a social justice Jesus championing the cause of the poor and the oppressed and the outcasts, the socially marginalized, showing tolerance and no judgment, promoting universal love and the brotherhood of man. There's boyfriend Jesus, or maybe girlfriend Jesus, who wraps his arms around us as we sing about his intoxicating love in our secret place. And there's the good example, Jesus, who shows people how to change the planet and how to become a better you. And then, then there's Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, the second face of the Trinity, not just another prophet, not just another rabbi, not just another Marvel Comics wonder working hero of the day. He was the son of David, the one they'd been waiting for, the one to deliver them from captivity, the goal of the Mosaic Law, those first five books, Yahweh in the flesh. He has come to establish God's reign and rule forever. The one who came to heal the sick. The one who gave sight to the blind. The one who gave freedom to prisoners and proclaims good news to the poor. The Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. This Jesus was the creator with God and the Holy Spirit who came to earth to begin a new creation. He embodied the covenant of the Old Testament. He fulfilled all the commandments his father had given. And he reversed the curse that had been put on earth. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of and promised us and made covenant about. This Christ is not a reflection of the current mood of how you wake up today, of who you need to vote for. He is not the projection of our own desires. This Christ is the Lord and God. He is God's Son. He is the third head, second head of the Trinity. He is the Savior of the world. He came to substitute for our sins. He is more loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. This is the true Christ. The one that Paul chastised the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4. He could be saying the same thing to our church today. Listen to what he said in chapter 11, somewhat sarcastically, for their own cavalier evidence of embrace of teachers that were fabricating a false Christ, generated by a false spirit, bringing a false gospel. Has anyone heard that today? Paul says, you seem to believe whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach about a different Jesus than the one we preach about, or a different spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. The Corinthians, you see, were, they were being led astray by the serpent's crafty deceptions, just like Eve was, abandoning simple devotion to the God that loved her and the Corinthians, and all of us to the genuine Christ for an alluring invention of an alternate Christ. Have any of you read any news articles or Facebook posts or, or watched on the news about this false Christ that is being promoted in our world today? Paul started warning us about it 2,000 years ago. In 2 Timothy, Paul says, the trend it will continue in the future. And I think we all can say that he's correct. Amen? With the church turning their ticklish ears from truth to myth, legends choosing man-made fictions over doctrinal facts. Jesus himself warned of these future impostors and charlatans masquerading as messiahs who would mislead many in Matthew 24. 
And we have seen much of this nonsense in our world and in our church. I'm a product of the 60s. And believe me, I grew up with a lot of nonsense. And if I didn't have enough by the time I got to college, I got overloaded with it there. It is amazing that I even stand on the Word of God at all and that I am behind this pulpit preaching to you. But God used all of that nonsense and all of my stupid thinking to, to teach me the way. You know, there used to be a Bible called The Way. I have it still. He brought me to this moment that I might tr teach the truth about Jesus and not hang on to these blasphemous ideas of Jesus that some people have. Does anybody remember Woodstock? That was the beginning of a whole new generation, a psychedelic, if it feels good, do it generation. Jesus and God, they're going to love you just like you are. And we hippie teenagers believed every word of that. We bought into it. The, the, the nonsense that we learned, many passed on down to their children. You have to remember, the problems in our church today did not start in 2016. They did not start in 2012. They did not start even in some of our lifetimes. You can go back to the 60s and read reports. The problems began over 50 years ago, and we have been battling the same war every year at annual conference. This remaking of our sinless Jewish Messiah from Nazareth into a progressive advocate of social justice is just the latest example of the tendency of people to fashion Christ in their own social, spiritual, and political image. Of course, in one sense, that shouldn't surprise us in the, in the world we're living in. Most folks have a genuine respect for Jesus, as they should. But it's, and, and I guess it's understandable that, that they want to bring him in on, on weighty matters that matter to them, that they would want Jesus on their side, but most people want the Jesus that they have made on their side. To follow God, we have to have a clear vision of who the real Jesus is. And we cannot have a clear view of the real Jesus unless we study the God-breathed Word of God. How do you study the Bible? Do you read a devotion in the morning that has a few nice verses that makes you feel good to get on through the rest of the day? And you tell yourself, well, that was nice. I can make it now. Or do you follow or read the Bible plan? Some years ago, I gave everyone a, a read the Bible in a year plan for Christmas. But there's many online. It's not hard to find one. One of my favorite uh, Read the Bible online programs is called Bible Recap by Tara Lee Cobble. And she's wonderful. You're assigned a lot of reading, a couple of chapters sometimes. But, but you read your readings each day and then you listen to her 10-minute podcast and, and she gives you Christian insight about what you've just read. And then she gives you information where to go get more information. It's a wonderful, wonderful plan. And I urge you to study yourself. Find a plan and use it. Don't let your pastor be the only person teaching you about Jesus because she's not perfect. She's not perfect. Read his word yourself. Study his word. Depend on and ask for the spirit to guide you through your studies. And ask God to fill you with the wisdom that Solomon talked about in Proverbs. To feed your mind. Find or start a Bible study. It's time the men of our church stand up and, and get together and, and have a study or gather on a regular basis. And, and if you need help with that, I can help you get that started. The women have a Bible study that meets in the morning. If you need one in the evening, I'm happy to help start that also. 
a church that has small groups that are meeting for the sole purpose to learn more about Jesus is a healthy church that is thriving. And because it is thriving, it will survive all the evils of the word, world that want to close its doors. Bible study, scripture reading, that is how you get to know Jesus. That is the way that we as build the kingdom in this community, the kingdom of God. But don't turn Jesus into something he's not. That list that I read at the beginning, all of those titles have a whiff of the truth of Jesus. But when we are worshiping one of those gods, we are not worshiping the true triune God. This is Trinity Sunday. And as you can see, I'm kind of focusing on the second head of the Trinity this morning because there's many in this world that have moved far from the purpose of the life of Christ. And if that person is listening right now in the pew or online, I, I want to make sure that by the time I quit talking, they feel different about Jesus. Purpose. Jesus came to this world for a purpose, not just to... Not just to make history, not just to walk around in barefoot or in sandals, not just to, to make a name for himself. He had a specific purpose to teach us how to love his Father, our God, and how to love one another. He never said that loving a sinner means accepting the sin. In fact, in fact, if you remember Matthew 18, he said the exact opposite. In fact, it's kind of uh, brutal, I think, what he told us to do with our friends that sin. He says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he doesn't listen to you, then take one or two more friends with you and try again. And, and if he still doesn't listen to you, then, then take him to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the believers of the church, then let him be to you as one that is lost, as one that is not going to believe. I think that's the end of the scripture, but I think if, if Jesus would have continued on, I think he would have said, and don't stop praying for him or her. Jesus wants us always to pray for one another. That's how we love one another, is, is, is we, we, we take the vilest sinner and we pray for them to know God, to love Jesus. God loves the sinner, but until that sinner knows Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and repents of his sin, he is not going to be saved. In my heart, and this is just Rev Bev, in my heart, I believe Jesus came to earth, left the beauty of the royalty of heaven behind for three basic reasons. The first two I've already named, to love God and love one another. Because he told us how to do that. Before he came, we didn't know how to love a sinner. We, we stoned them. We tried to stone them to death. We didn't know how to love them. But the third reason, and the greatest reason of all, was to offer us salvation and eternal life. And the only path to salvation is to totally repent, do a 180, turn from your sinful life, and accept Jesus as our only Savior. This does not mean we're never going to sin again, friends. Don't put that kind of burden on your shoulders. You are going to sin again. You might sin again before you walk out the doors. You're going to sin. But we have a Father in heaven that wants to forgive us for those sins. Jesus had greater purpose than winning Super Bowls, than with just being a social justice guru, hippie, good guy walking around. His purpose was our salvation. His purpose was to forgive us and to work with us because I got news for you. We can't save ourselves. We are not God. When we try to pluck from this book the Holy Word, 
when we start plucking scriptures out of here that we think we need to make our point or to back up our beliefs, then we have at that very moment started to make Jesus into our image. And we are using God's holy word as a weapon to do so. And that is blasphemy, friends. That is not the way the word of God was sent to us to be used. Our loving God did not send his son to be molded into our needs and our desires. In fact, Jesus had so much to say about his own mission that we don't even need to think and try to figure out why Jesus came. He told us himself. In Luke, he says that he came to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. He made it clear, though, that his kingdom was not of this world. And, and it was not a physical kingdom bringing social justice and wealth redistribution or political or cultural equity. Rather, it is a spiritual kingdom to bring forgiveness, to bring salvation, to bring eternal life to all that will call on the name of Jesus. For Jesus, salvation was not economic prosperity or equal distribution of goods or sexual liberty without judgment or shame. Instead, salvation comes through belief in him. And there is nothing you can ever do, ever, that's going to make God stop loving you. And there's nothing you can ever do that you cannot be forgiven for. Salvation comes through belief in Jesus. And Jesus told us in John, God so loved, or John told us in, in chapter 3, God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Because God didn't send his son into this world to judge the world. He sent him here to love us. He sent him here that the world might be saved through him. Jesus tells us in Luke, as the woman is being stoned, For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she has loved much. But he who has loved little, who has forgiven little, loves little. And then he said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Jesus knew that in order to accomplish his mission, that he had to suffer and he had to die and he had to be raised again, just like Moses and all of the prophets had foretold. And so in Luke chapter 24, he tells them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things that are written about me in the law of Moses and by the prophets and, <clears throat> and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and will rise again. Friends, we serve the God of an empty tomb. He rose from the dead the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sin would proclaim his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Remember last Sunday we had Pentecost and, and the disciples started the church in Jerusalem and then they went into all the world. In the words of Jesus, I, I hear him clearly not making promises that our life is going to be a rose garden when, he, when we start following him. I, I do not hear him saying that all injustice is going to end. I do not hear him saying all wars will end. I do not hear him saying that all will be equally um, provided for financially. In fact, he said the opposite. He said there will always be wars and rumors of wars. He said that the poor will always be among us. But he also said that we've got to take care of them. It's us not Jesus. I don't hear him promoting himself as the social justice God that some have made him out to be. To be clear, in my mind, there's just no question that the God in Scripture has a heart for the genuinely oppressed and destitute. I mean, 
Jesus and God had great concern for their people and for the church. When Jesus encountered deep human need, he didn't turn around and walk away from it. He responded with compassionate action. Characteristically, he healed the sick because he loved them so much. He cast out the demons from those that were suffering from them. He raised the dead. And in two instances, physically, he fed the multitudes with nothing to begin with and had food left over. Even so, Jesus' principal purpose was redressing spiritual poverty, not financial poverty, not rectifying social inequities. This morning on Trinity Sunday, let's stop trying to make the Godhead something he never claimed to be. He loved us enough to leave heaven and make sure that we all know him and love him and love his father and love one another and live with him eternally. And yes, when you have Jesus in your heart, that second face of the Trinity, I believe that you have everything you need for this pilgrim journey that we're walking on. You have the courage and the power of God. You have the love and the joy of the Son. And you've got the peace and comfort that surpasses all understanding from the Holy Spirit. When you properly serve our triune God with all of your heart, you will honor God every day in all you do. You will tell his story. You will make new disciples. And that's what the kingdom building, perfect, sinless Jesus Christ came to earth for. To make a way for us all. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Let us recognize the real Jesus when we see him. If you are able, will you please stand and turn to page 170. And let's love this Jesus that came just for us. And let us not make him into our own image. Let us leave with the courage of God, the love of Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>